right, welcome to another er episode of Urban X TV. We got the Black Dot in the building. Yes, sir. For a very special episode. And he's gonna go into what he likes to call the making of Jay-Z's 444. What's up, how you doing? Peace, peace, peace. It's a pleasure as always. UrbanX.NYC, these will be the exclusives from Black Dot pretty much from now on. And um, I know there are a lot of uh, breakdowns coming out about Jay-Z's album, uh, the importance of it or insignificance or depending how you see it. And I just wanted to add my two cents to it in the way that Black Dot, you know, kind of break things down. So we'll call this the making of 444 because there are gonna be so many layers and this is gonna be part one. There'll be so many layers to this story because it is intricate. It's right. not as cut and dry as Jay-Z decides to uh, put out an album being socially, consciously, economically, politically aware all of a sudden, and now people are flipping their lids. Is it some conspiracy theories behind it? Is he genuine about it? So I wanna open up with an open letter that I wrote to Jay-Z five years ago when Blue Ivy was born. And I think it's significant because it sets the tone for what we may be seeing. Okay. All right. So with that being said, bear with me. I don't have my glasses. You know, you turn 50, you, you know, your eyes start going bad. All right. All right. Uh, dear Jay-Z, I would first like to congratulate you and Beyonce on giving birth to a beautiful baby girl. There is nothing greater in this world than to bring forth life, especially when you are in love with the person in which that life is manifested. Something as great as having a child changes a man. It changes his perspective on life. No amount of money or material gain can equate to the smile of a child that you help to create. This energy is magnified when a man has a daughter because it forces him to truly acknowledge and respect the power of female energy. Growing up in the hood without our fathers presents a uh, present forces a lot of us to become ultra masculine to compensate for their absence. This may be expressed in the way we treat women or view women altogether, but a beautiful baby girl changes all of that. You become her supreme protector because as a man, you understand some of the ramifications that women who grew up without their fathers can have on their self-esteem. You, bear with me here, you understand that they can begin to equate love with sex, which leads them to being taken advantage of. And the way that women, especially women of color, are portrayed in the media doesn't help this cause at all. As a father of a daughter myself, I know all too well the importance of protecting her innocence at all costs. This includes monitoring the music she listens to, the videos she watches, as well as the magazines she reads. Some of your music and the way that you have portrayed women in the past has been questionable at best. But none of that matters anymore, Jay-Z. You are a part of a new team now, and that's the father-daughter team. And whether you are a millionaire or working a nine to five, we have one rule and one rule only, and that is to protect our daughters at all costs. You are a man of great power and worldly influence who has amassed a great fortune in the world of entertainment. While I don't expect that to change, I can only hope that greater consideration is given when making a music video or signing an artist that may not be as favorable to women. Beyonce, you too have a great responsibility as well. You are one of the greatest musical icons the world has ever seen. But little eight and nine year old girls gyrating their pelvises trying to emulate you is not cute at all. 
I can't solely place the blame on YouTube because we have a responsibility to do our part. But the sphere of influence you two have is tremendous. Based on what we see now in the media, can you imagine what kind of sexual uh, temptations Blue Ivy will be faced with? Jay, you have the power to start a new trend. And we fathers are willing to follow your lead as we clean up the cultural mess that we have collectively created. Blue Ivy's birth can serve as a wake up call for all of us. Let's call it a 10 year plan to clean up the music industry so that she can grow up void of the images and music that plagued the generation before her. You have the power to reach many, but the responsibility will trickle down to each and every father, brother, and husband to do their part. We can be, we, what has been done or said about women in the past doesn't matter because we can't change the past, but we can change the future, starting with the most beautifulest thing in this world, peace. And once again, congratulations on the arrival of Blue Ivy Carter, the black dot, author of Hip Hop Decoded, and father of a beautiful daughter. Now, I want to lay that out as Exhibit A, okay? As we begin to examine what may have brought forth 444. Okay. Okay, it may be as simple as him having a child on his own, a beautiful girl, and now he sees the error of his own ways because his own daughter is looking up to him. And when did you pin this letter? I pinned this letter January in 2012 when okay. uh, Blue Ivy was first born. Okay. And I felt the need to do so because I understand uh, children can change a man. Okay. You know what I'm saying? From the most hardest, ruggedest dude on the street when he has his baby a lot of times that perspective is enough to change his views on things especially when he has a baby girl so i felt that was the primary time to send an open letter i don't know if he got it or not it wasn't even really about him it was about putting something in the atmosphere so to speak in hopes that he did get it you know what i mean and i think i might have backdoored it to guru because, uh, you know, I I'm, I'm, uh, uh, had a relationship with Google. Google. Okay. Very down-to-earth, intelligent brother. Uh, very approachable and very knowledgeable of great things that I wasn't really aware of until we sat down and just kind of chopped it up. Right. Um, you know, that, along with, uh, it's also important to add when you have a child by someone you're in love with. See, that's a whole different energy altogether because... That's the best part, as we say in Supreme Mathematics. Uh, a knowledge and wisdom borns understanding, and that understanding is the best part. So when there's a synergy between a man and woman, and their love is manifested in a child, it can create a whole different energy and outlook in a man. Right. So Jay-Z was in love with Beyonce when they had Blue Ivy, right? right. So I felt if any time to reach him, it was there. Now I want to hit on a couple of key bullet points of this letter. I said there was a 10 year plan. We are five years into that 10 year plan and right. we haven't made a lot of progress. But with that being said, I don't want to give up hope on it. Maybe the 444 represents we got four years, four months and four days left to figure this shit out. Right. Okay. Um, I also wanted to stress that love has no status. So whether you're a billionaire or a, a, a postal worker, your love for your daughter is not greater than my love for my daughter. Right. You may have greater influence and can buy her more shit or whatever, but the love has no status. You ever see a Mexican family walking down the street and the dad, he's got the five kids behind him because, you know, they pump him out. And the dad is holding his wife's hand and they're eating a mango and a little kid maybe kicking a ball. But you can sense that there's love 
beyond anything else. They may be struggling. He might be working two goddamn jobs, this and that, but there's a sense of love and you can almost feel it. So I only say that to say no monetary status uh, can equate that your love for your daughter is greater than mine. I also wanted to make a point that uh, to mention Beyonce as well, to say that she too has great influence in this particular situation. Right. Uh, also, I think the, the most, the main bulletin point was that it's not their responsibility to raise our children. That's a good point. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Like we too have responsibility. It's my responsibility to protect my daughter. However, with Jay-Z's influence, uh, he can be the spearhead that can trickle down and we can actually create a movement, so to speak, to protect our daughters because this is getting out of control. Mm -hmm. The images that we're seeing and just what our women in particular are facing. And I can't have that conversation with you unless you have a daughter. It's something about having children that makes it all make sense. So for all these years, Jay-Z didn't have children or anyone that he claimed or was in love with. I don't know about his backstory as you read the tabloids. He might have a couple of children out here, but the one that he loved and the one that he recognizes, that particular child, you know what I mean? He couldn't understand this conversation 10 years ago because he didn't have any children. Right. It's almost like you can't explain love. You can't quantify that shit on paper, right? That's why you say, yo, why my man bugging like that? Because your man is in love and your man can't explain it because that shit can't be explained. You got to walk that walk. You got to go through it. You got to experience it. You got to go, God damn, this love shit is, is crazy. That's why it makes brothers and sisters other than themselves. Jay-Z for years, at least publicly, was denying his love for his woman because maybe he felt it made him weak. Little do he know it made him strong, as we will begin to see as we go through the 444 breakdown. You know what I'm saying? But you know, you shielding yourself to protect yourself on some hood shit and you know what I mean? So those two factors, I know he loves his woman. He looked at that beautiful baby girl. So I felt this letter is exhibit A and maybe the main reason 444 came about. For some of y'all, you can turn the camera off now. That's all you needed to know. You know, Jay-Z finally had a kid, finally fell in love, and as a result, he decided to pen the 444. For those of us who understand that this is much deeper than that, keep the cameras rolling. Keep the moving rolling. <clears throat> also, the reference to time is important as well. I speak in my book, Urban Culture Decoded, which is this one. Right, I speak in reference to time, children, especially parents who are not together, right, have uh, a tendency to want their dads in particular to spend more time with them. They're not, not concerned about the money you shell out. Don't get me wrong, dads. Even if you and mom ain't together, there is a monetary responsibility, but that's to the mother. The child would rather see you at their soccer game. Or, you know what I mean? They equate your love for them with time. Not necessarily you came by and bought a watch or you did this and that. <clears throat> it's time. So get this book as I go through. Uh, some of the aspects of that that parents need to understand. So we'll call that part Exhibit A, right? Jay-Z grows up finally and he sees some things through most of our eyes and as a result, it, he felt the need to put out an album that was a little bit more socially conscious, socially aware, more about, you know. <clears throat> With that being said, Jay, um, there is a responsibility on your part if you are the boss that you say you are to maybe consider or reconsider signing some of the artists that you do sign if they don't share our father-daughter 
philosophy because how else are we supposed to protect these babies? Right? right? Any questions so far? Uh, well, my main question was <clears throat> at first, where, what was the, the response to this open letter when you put it out? Um, the response overwhelmingly was, was positive from the, the so-called conscious community because they understood where I was coming from. Even, you know, uh, uh, Brother Paul, Minister Paul Scott out of uh, Charlotte uh, is the one who really told me to take it viral and he the one who put it on a lot of different social networks. Okay. You know, because I was just writing for self in hopes that the universe and the algorithms within, uh, you know, the internet would get it to him so that, you know what I'm saying, he can know that we're watching as a collective. So the response, you know, in general was was positive. Right. If you have a child and you understood that, I wasn't saying, here, Jay, here's my daughter, take care of her. I'm going to take care of that. But it would help if there's a trickle-down effect from your position at Def Jam or whatever he was at at, at that specific time. <clears throat> because it takes a village, as we always say, right. To raise these babies, just like uh, you know, the internet is not solely responsible for raising your babies. It has played an effect on it because our children are sold into this digital realm. Okay. You know what I mean? I understand. So, the next thing I wanted to address was the conscious community, uh, conscious rappers, uh, and even mainstream rappers who are pissed off because they've been delivering this message for goddamn years now. You know what I'm saying? Same message. And now all of a sudden Jay-Z delivers this message. What are you talking about? 444. 444. Right. Jay-Z now is at the starting at the his album comes in at the be, beginning point of Public Enemy's career. Public Enemy been saying this shit, brand Nubians, X Clan, poor righteous teachers. KRS one, the list goes on and on of this message of responsibility, this message of family, this message of all of this. But for some reason, Jay Z says this now, and now everybody's uh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Part of the reason is because Jay Z is that dude. I'm just gonna say Jay Z is that dude. So for all you conscious rappers, look in the mirror and just accept you're not that dude, right? And I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm gonna explain to you what I mean, right? Everybody, we all grew up in the hood with a dude who played ball better than us, right? We all grew up with a dude who dressed better than us, uh, had more swag than we did, uh, you know what I mean? Got more girls than we did. He was just that dude. His swag was on that. Jay-Z is the one. Okay, there are millions of rappers, but why does Jay-Z resonate with so many? I'm, I'm gonna break that all down as, as best I can. <clears throat> Bob Marley was the one. Many niggas is doing reggae songs. Bob Marley, we recognize, is something about his energy, his vibration, his spirit. Right, because we understand we are spiritual, having a human experience, and that spirit and energy can use anyone that it sees fit to accomplish its specific goals. Right? right. Jay Z's flow from the beginning. You heard reasonable doubt. It changed the tectonic plates of your subconscious mind the minute you heard it. You knew this shit was something special. Right? And when I say flow, I don't just mean his lyrics. I mean his walk, his talk, the way his hat is tilt. You know what I'm saying? We all have a flow about it. Some people's flow is stronger than others' flow. Now, with that being said, Michael Jackson was the one. Uh, Michael Jordan was the one. Being the one and having the necessary platforms to harness that one energy are two different things. Right? Now, Jay-Z could have been nice and never left Brooklyn, right? But he was given a platform. So we don't want to negate the platform as I'm speaking about the one because we all, that dude in certain circles and this and that. But how many dudes you knew play ball? Like, yo, that nigga could have went pro, son. But 
the universe didn't align or he didn't pursue or she didn't pursue it to the point and they just became because Michael Jordan could have easily been just a rec room legend right right but he was able to go to college excuse me he was able to uh go on pro on these platforms which are not our platforms now we can get into some of that Illuminati shit I'm a broad spread that because the Illuminati has deemed to me anything you don't fucking understand whether it's finances, whether it's people in high places, whether it's occult symbols, whether it's esoteric shit, we use the term because it is such a fundamental term now to use. I can use it in a general sense and dudes on the corner <clears throat> who can vibrate with it now, they may not be able to break it all down, but they have a general understanding now. So I use that for lack of better words, okay. right? A lot of people get turned off. A lot of people get turned off and, well, they should now because it's so watered down. I'm gonna jump around now. So let's say 1996, Prodigy on the LL Cool J remix says, Illuminati want my mind, soul, and my body. Secret society, trying to keep the eye on me. That was the first time I had heard it recorded and said in so-called of a mainstream song. Now, for those of us who had already been studying the uh, New World Order books in the 80s and uh, uh, A. Ralph Epperson's The Hidden Hand and uh, Behold the Pale Horse, we had already had a, a greater understanding of what the word Illuminati meant, illuminated ones. We had knew the history of Adam Weishaupt and coming out of Germany and these secret societies that had already existed prior to hip hop and all that other shit. What we did, my crew, is we spent time <clears throat> because we also understood the universal principles as above, so below, as within, so without. So we spent time breaking down the Illuminati concept in great detail as it referred or as, a, as it ref, uh, referred to hip hop, as it referred to the music industry. As it, you know what I'm saying, referred to uh, uh, basketball or sports and just was trying to give you an underlining understanding that if there is an elite group of individuals who run the world, everything is at their disposal. And every medium, them of course creating these mediums, is they can go in and out and use them as they see fit. Does not mean Jay-Z is in the Illuminati, right? right? Now, but time, and I will say this, first of all, let me shout out some of my classmates who we began to study this stuff all at the same time. I see the Duke of Tears, Red Pill, Blue Pill, uh, the Ghetto Shaman, K KB out of Atlanta, uh, Brother Will I Am off the uh, Super Hey Rules joint, A.A. Rashid, uh, Brother Rich, the young elder who did the Five Bloodlines of Hip Hop with me, uh, Young Rich uh, from Underground Railroad, Brother Panic, Brother Tefiru, Brother Roswell, uh, Brother Will who was breaking down the God Gene, uh, the list goes Brother Ampu, the list goes on and on Let's add Brother Chris. Let's add Brother Shabazz. We all were in the same classes in terms of the conscious community learning on or around the same time. Now I say that, now I'm from the old paradigm of the conscious community. I came in on the back end in 96 with Sister Burt, uh, Brother Big Man, Brother Leon, Brother Clemson Brown. And if you pan through the crowd, you'll see me in those uh, lectures learning. However, there were not a lot of young people there at that specific time. And I felt that I was there getting a download that would eventually change the paradigm of hip hop as we know it. Now, with that being said, Brother Chris had a vision after watching some of Phil Valentine's tapes. Uh, and this is in like 2001, you know, 2002 and decided he wanted to bring Phil in. 
So Brother Shabazz, who already had I Open the Productions, me, him, and Chris just kind of joined together. Uh, we didn't plan it, and we gave a lecture on the, the winter solstice of 2002 with Phil Valentine. The name of that lecture escapes me at the time. And history as we know it changed. Um, because our goal was to bring this information to a younger audience. See, the paradigm before was a lot of elders getting this information. Young people have the ability to activate on that information. That's why you'll see blacked out on all those tapes. I got throwback jerseys on, um, you know, adding a little hip hop swag. And it brought out a younger crowd of the brothers that I just mentioned. And it let me know that there were other young brothers on the same thought process. So when I wrote Hip Hop Decoded, which is this baby here, this is the original. It wasn't just me translating uh, Phil Valentine, Bobby Hammett, C. Freeman L., uh, Henry D. Bernardo, and some of the Steve Coakley. I, I became a hip hop to Hootie, so to speak and was scribing what they were teaching, these esoteric, occult, metaphysical, astrological teachings into a hip hop format so brothers and sisters on the corner could understand higher principles. Now, once you understand them, it is your duty to, to pursue it as you see fit. So I, as I said, I translated this information, but also, the young brothers who I just mentioned, a lot of their thoughts are in this book as well because we were kind of sharing ideas and concept. It's just that I wrote Hip Hop Decoded and everyone gets credit for that. I wanna, you know, throw that out there. So um, we understand, you know, where this is going. Um, in 2004, I did a lecture, my very first, lecture on hip hop called the Chronicles of Hip Hop. It was about six and a half hours long and it went through a litany of things. Brother Shabazz is the one I give credit for that because he kept being on my case. Yo, yo, Doc, we need to get this on tape. We need to get this on tape. I, I wasn't really, I'm Virgo, you know, I was in my little bag. I'm good. I'll wait because I was writing the book at the time. So I'll wait until the book comes out. But Brother Panic had did a lecture uh, it's about, about eight, nine hours long breaking down the history of hip hop. I don't even know where the hell he got all these documents from, but it was a real accurate chronological breakdown of a lot of people who contributed in hip hop who didn't get their credit. You know what I mean? And, and that's important because uh, we're talking about <clears throat> a movement that was taking place simultaneously. So, you know, Panic did this long breakdown, it was nine or 10 hours, and that was what Panic, I mean, uh, Shabazz used to get me. He was like, yo, see, Panic is, is on it. So I said, you know what? I looked in retrospect at Panic's calling all those names as like a libation right. for me to come forth and do what I did. Also, Panic had did a short lecture We had a cigar and a bottle of Henny. And when I saw it, I said, that's it. Though so that's the stage prop I'm going to use to resonate with young people to get them to sit down for seven hours. And to this day, that bottle of Henny became a staple because wherever I was traveling with, and I don't, I, at that point, I wasn't even drinking like right. that. Wherever I would travel around the country, they would make sure I had a bottle of Henny as if, you know what I mean? But that credit goes to panic uh, because he's the one who kind of used that. And I said, that's a good look for me to put that up on my counter as sort of like a hip hop stage prop. But I say all that to come all the way back around and say, we were talking about the Illuminati in full detail long before uh, this stuff got popular on the internet. You follow what I'm saying? And we were giving you the explanations, the breakdown and just applying it to what it would be in hip hop and I was saying, Jay-Z better be careful because it's obvious he's the one. And I've always said you don't have to 
control millions, you need control over one who has control over millions. And it was clear to me that he was going to be that one. So it was clear that Jay Z was the one, even though like around that time you said like oh four, it was a lot of dudes that were neck and neck with him. DMX, Fifty Cent. Now DMX had sold more records than Jay Z. Okay. Oh, uh, you know when they were coming out Def Jam, you know the meeting they had Ja Rule at the battle, right. DMX, Jay, and they all kind of took so. Peace. You know you had that battle. You know, and a piece went here, a piece went there, and they all kind of started out. Jay-Z might have started out the slowest. You know right, what I'm saying? Yeah. Because Ja Rule popped. DMX popped. And I think that they were on the, using the Tupac energy. We'll talk a lot about light, uh, uh, ultralight beams and people riding your light. Bing, bing, bing. <clears throat> to reach their specific defini uh, destination. However, when you heard Reasonable Doubt, and in retrospect, I said Reasonable Doubt was better than Ready to Die to me because ready to die was from a street perspective uh you know what i'm saying a hustler and reasonable doubt was like a boss it was some boss sh shit from the beginning the way jay-z laid it out lyrically see because now we're talking uh being able to paint pictures with your words that are extremely vivid hustlers t prior to that point had not heard of Somebody articulate. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I thought reasonable doubt in particular uh, uh, manifested uh, a blueprint, so to speak, of a hustler's manual from a boss perspective. And Jay-Z told you he was gonna take this shit over. And I thought, like I said, DMX sold a lot more records early. Uh, and then Ja Rule had his moment before 50 came up on the scene and took his life. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? So, uh, with that being said, I felt that now we get into an aspect of when I talk about the one, in order to be the one, you gotta get some help. Right. So, now we can get onto some of them, them Jews, Leo Cohen and them, who saw something in Jay-Z that spoke of a corporate etiquette that they could work with. You understand? Yeah. So uh, you have to throw that into it as we begin to lay this out. Because you can't be all powerful if the Jews own Hollywood, and they do. That's not anti-Semitic. I wouldn't give a shit anyway. But you understand my point? Yeah. That's just, those are just facts, right? And if they own the media, and they own Hollywood, and they own the entertainment industry, and they own the music industry because these are way stations in which uh, platforms that are created for raw talent and energy, who we are, to manifest into something that they can fully take advantage of. All right? All right. Let's be clear with that. So, um, that's, you know, they own all of this. And if they own all of it, why you, you would first say, well, why aren't it filled with Jews? If Jews own the industry, it would be Jews all in the music. And that's not what they do. First of all, they're not the real Jews. I don't want to turn this into that kind of lecture. But they must stay close to you because you are the magic ones. You are the ones who can make things manifest in the physical that can be taken advantage of. You're the ones that can steer energy from here, there, whatever the case may be. Perfect example, the two dichotomies that I'm trying to express is you have Jay-Z, who was more... Uh, the spook who sat by the door, so to speak, peeping things and understanding. Then you had Dame Dash, so we talk house nigga, field nigga, still nigga. Right. So you're still talking about niggas, right? Where Dame Dash came in and saw, wait a minute, why am I paying these Jews who don't care nothing about our culture, have no true connection to our culture, but they're making the most money? Let's get rid of them. So he began to conspire, as the story told with Irv Gotti and Suge Knight. Suge Knight and Jay Prince and them. It's like, yo, once we figure out the distribution game, we don't need them for shit. We got the raw talent. Right. They own all the distribution channel. And simultaneously, they all kind of got arrested or things happened to them because 
These Jews spent years building this empire. They're not going to let you tear it down. A very good book to read is an empire of our own. Uh, the name of it escapes me. It's in your library, young man, that I bestowed upon you. A very good book on how they built Hollywood. And there are aspects within Hollywood that we'll talk about during this piece. We're still talking about the making of 444, but it's important that I lay out certain components of it. So they cashed their net. Jay-Z came back as the one who probably could fit the protocol of intelligent, uh, very witty. See, they may have even uh, gave him a few tricks on how to harness his magic. Go see Harry Potter. Just because you are a magician using words, and when you put the S on the other side of words, it becomes sword. So we understand that the, the, the magic in the word and how it's used to manifest the earth, air, fire, water that manifests through the word, right? The throat shock was what? Color. Blue. Okay. So as Jay-Z laying out his blueprint, right? It was all manifested from him understanding the magic that came out of his words that can paint pictures. And he did four blueprints. He did one, two, and three. Blue Ivory. When you remove the Y of her name, it's I-V, which is the Roman numeral four. four. So that was the fourth blueprint. Oh, wow. Okay, when you when really want to look at it. And he, you know, because he does things in, in fours. Four, right? As we understand, and we'll get to that. I'll leave the super numerology of that to Blue Pill, who go through the law of 44 and blow your mind on just how intricate it is. But I will touch on it as we get uh, uh, later on uh, uh, down the pipe. So, Jay-Z's ability to use words, how he was using them. And I want to make this clear too, he wasn't talking no revolutionary shit. Right? right? So at this point, hip hop is moving into the phase of let's get money, let's, let's turn away from the revolutionary shit. Right? The evolution of hip hop at the beginning, yes, yes, y'all, and you don't stop or keep on until the break of dawn. I just throw your hands in the air, right? That was a cadence, right? And Busy B, oh man, is it Virgo? Is it Scorpio? You know, we went through that phase of hip hop, right? right. Not harmful. I always say by naming it hip hop, we killed it. You know what I'm saying? Because we, we gave it a name and we gave it form. When you give something form, those who are outside of the culture who don't understand it uh, can go back to their little boardrooms because all of these boardrooms had a, a minion, a go for a black person that they would say, he's in charge of cultural stuff. What's going on on the streets? Well, boss, uh, there's a new phenomenon called hip hop on the streets and yada, 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 yada. They ignored it first because it wasn't really no money in it, right? Melly Mel drops the message. Child is born with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind. Now this shit started showing potential. Like this could be a platform used for us to raise ourselves up. You know what I'm saying? To unite, to speak to more people than we had ever spoken to before. Even Run DMC <clears throat> put out It's Like That and that's the way it is as their first single. Now we flipped it over to the B side and Suck MC shit was the street shit, but there was a social awareness taking place in the music, right? And then of course, the doors open for Karis One, X-Clan, Brand New being Public Enemy, Poor Righteous Teachers, uh, Lakim Shabazz, Big Daddy Kane, Rakim, and a slew of others. Now, it wasn't all positive. We had some shit in there. We had Lottie Dottie by Slick Rick, but he also gave you Children's Story. We had, uh, we had a variety of stuff, but the potential, if left <clears throat> unabided and left alone, the natural growth of hip hop was gonna be a revolutionary music that was gonna use media platforms like never before to unite, to inform, to charge, to galvanize a people. Hands down, if you wanna know about the unknown, we study the known. And in 88, 89, 90, 
What was known is this music was becoming dangerous, not for us, for the power structures that be. We'll throw that word out there again, Illuminati. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that, right? So it was evident that this music had potential to be something great. Rakim said, keep staring soon. You suddenly see a star. You better follow it because it's the R. So he had already had us looking toward the heavens. They had already been telling us we was the God. The black man is God. Karis, one of them, had already had us reading. You know what I mean? They had already had us getting rid of the golds and putting on the red, black, and green medallions. They had already had ladies first with Queen Latifah, and the ladies began to make this. So there was a movement like none other. We call it the golden era. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, we were using the four elements of hip hop, earth, air, fire, water, the, the b-boy, the MC, the drummer, the dancer. Uh, you know what I'm saying? As you can see on the cover of the book here, as alchemy, you know what I'm saying? To transform uh, lead into gold, right? And the lead we was talking about was the lead pencils that led to gold. Records, gold teeth, gold chains. So we were taking nothing and making it into something. Right. You know, and if left alone, can you imagine where hip hop would be now, right? I say all of that to say, then they began to get it back in their boardrooms and see potential in this. Now they had to steer this away from that. So then we had NWA. It's, it's just that simple. Right. Not straight out of Compton NWA because they put out Express Yourself, Fuck the Police. It was when Dre and them did niggas for life in particular. It was the greatest movie on wax. It wasn't even wax, yeah, wax and cassettes I had ever heard. They were painting vivid, vivid pictures of what was going on in LA. So I don't want to sit here and blame NWA because that's again dealing with the effects and not the cause. However, these pictures were extremely vivid and it shifted us away from more revolutionary stuff. Now remember Ice Cube came east, got with the bomb squad, and he continued his journey of putting out positive messages in his music. NWA went on a whole nother course, right? right. And they opened up Pandora's box, all right? And then it became more or less about social awareness to a certain degree and it became about bitches ain't shit but hoes and trick. Let's get this money. Let's let's turn this into. It got so bad that every record company over here was looking for NWA. So when my classmate Tim Dog was looking for his record deal, and he came off the Ultra Magnetic tree, Ultra Magnetic MCs, they all wanted NWA. They kept saying we want NWA. It forced him to get frustrated. He went home and wrote Fuck Compton which is the first shot in the East Coast, West Coast war. A lot of people don't talk about it, but he had a number one single with no radio airplay called Fuck Compton. You know what I'm saying? In hindsight, he probably should have said fuck NWA and not fuck a whole city, but that was the first shot. And that was based out of his frustration of labels looking for this now. Why? Because sex and violence does what? So. It sells. And if it's going to sell in movies and N.W.A. put out a audio movie, <clears throat> the potential was there to steer us away from consciousness and into let's get this money. Right. right. So he puts out Fuck Compton. He even performed that shit in San Francisco and almost got his ass beat and was cornered in the kitchen with these gangbangers coming at him until Tupac's call pulled out against them niggas and protected Tim Dog, and Tim Dog never forgot that. You know what I mean? So I say all of that to say, we're getting back up to reasonable doubt, right? That the climate was set now for a monetary shift to take place and to shift the consciousness into something else. Now, on the internet, you'll find something called the secret letter of hip hop. I don't know if you ever saw this, or the secret meeting of oh, hip hop. Yeah, yeah. We don't know if that's true or not. Present, but 
prison system. Right. However, the effects of it is true. Right. The results. Right. Same thing with the Willie Lynch letter. I don't know if it's if it's factual and this and that. I know the effects That's, are. Right. So we can kind of still use it to, right? So P. Diddy, a dude named P. Diddy, gets a forty million dollar advance from uh, Clyde Davis, and hip hop, as you know, it changed again because what Biggie did was Biggie gave you niggas for life East, right? So as, as dope as the beats was on that Niggas for Life album, I could not stand these rappers. These West Coast rappers, because look, look at the standard that had already been set here on the East Coast. Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, Cool G Rap, KRS-One, uh, Kumo D, Grandmaster Kaz, Melly Mel. We were spoiled, but we were also 15 years ahead of them lyrically. Right. So I felt when Easy and them started rhyming, the shit double quadrupled down to work on won't time. He's gonna rhyme on the west move. We was like, this shit was giving me a headache. Right? right? But that's where they were lyrically because they had just got on the timeline. Ice T, you could throw ice T in there. They all had a very rudimentary rhyme style. I thought Ice Cube and Ren could really rap. No, they actually could. Ice Cube and Ren. It's the only reason I listen to that shit. Right. Right? But I'm just saying collectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, oh shit. Ice Cube was dope. Rim was probably the best out of all of them in DOC. DOC was nice. Let, let's, yeah. let's keep it clear with the DOC. Yeah. Right? So I, I'm only saying all of that to say when, when Big dropped Ready to Die, he had that slow flow talking MC style. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine, salt and pepper and heavy D up in the limousine. You know what I'm saying? Right. Rap and tap, Mr. Malky, Mal Mr. Magic Molly Ma. I let my tape rock to my tape pop. So he was more talk rapping. Prior to that, dudes is rhyming skills with this, that, that. You know, so we were trying to find out how many words I can rhyme in one 16 bar set to impress the next MC. Dre and them was like, we not into all of that. We gonna put that G function on, and my man gonna do his thing, slow it down. Diddy recognized that. He took them slow flow dudes, put that music we grew up on, the shit your mother used to play, you know what I'm saying, if you in your 40s, cleaning the house, and he added that flow onto that, and let Biggie give us an East Coast version of that shit. Money holes and clothes, it's all a nigga knows, right? And Biggie was a supreme MC. So then we were locked in. So if NWA didn't lock you into this, you know, money holes and clothes shit, Biggie definitely locked you in. Right. Right? You was like, oh shit, this shit is crazy. And I even uh, remember a story. And he slowed it down for the ladies, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which was important because ladies bought records. Niggas wasn't buying records. Ladies was buying records. I remember uh, Busta breaking down uh, on his Magnus Opus, talking about put your hands where my eye can see his number one song. He said he went to visit D uh, uh, Daddy's house with, with Diddy and him did all the recording. And Diddy told him, yeah, you got to stop fucking all that yelling on records because the girls don't understand what you're saying. As a result, he wrote, put your hands where my eyes can see. Right. Hit you with no delay, so what you're saying, yo. Sheila with that my shit, what's your dilly, yo. Yeah. When I be on the mic, yes, I do my duty, yo. You know, Rama is on the studio, you know, that whole piece. And it was his biggest hit because we all understood it. Prior to that, it was, y'all, y'all, y'all. You know, because Buster, first of all, you don't want to get on after Buster. So if you on the set, do your set, because when Buster come on, it's a wrap. But that particular song. So I'm only painting a picture of all of this preceded Reasonable Doubt. Nas showed up. Nas is from the Rock Eminem era. So if we were allowed to just progress naturally, you would have Nas and a bunch of other Nas's that preceded him or, you know, came after him. And here we are 20 years later. The music is supposed to be so magical and so dynamic, but there were, you know, things that took place. Reasonable Doubt shows up. 
And it's from a boss perspective. And the minute I heard this shit, I said, okay, this shit right here is crazy, right? right. And th that became, to me, the last remnants, you know, all about the Benjamins, all of that shit, reasonable doubt to flush out any of that socially conscious aware shit. Even Jay-Z said, I used to rhyme like common sense. After five million soul, I ain't been rhyming like common sense. Right? right? He didn't lie to you. He told you. You could deal with that how you want to deal with it. But he didn't lie. Right? Ironically, now he's rhyming like common sense once again. But I say all of that to say <clears throat> Jay-Z's influence. Right? He be it became clear that this dude had something. He had a magnetized energy to him that was quantum. Right? You know how you can walk in the room and tell certain dudes can control the room. I remember walking in the room and meeting ODB and knew that this dude, I didn't know who he was. I could literally feel his energy. It was something special about this specific dude. Some of us have that. Like we mentioned before, we had dudes who could have went pro, this and that. But there are other things that must take place for these things to happen. The platform was set now. The template was set now. We sh shelling out all that other shit. We're going to make some money off this shit. We're going to turn everybody into get money. And as a result, we have trap music. We got mumble rap. We got, you know, all these things. None of them socially aware anymore about galvanizing our people. So Jay-Z became a pawn in that sense. Right? right. <clears throat> now, when I say pawn... You think negative. You know what I'm saying? He's a puppet. Well, when you go to your fucking job at McDonald's and you flipping burgers, you a pawn too. Nigga, flip them fucking burgers so we can get these customers. So there's many le multiple layers to it. You cannot operate within the constructs of the matrix without being on their agenda in some capacity. You can say what you want to say. Jay-Z is a billionaire. That's not no fucking money. I'm going to say it again. Hove money is no money in the grand scheme of things. From a hood perspective, it's money hand over foot. But you got to broaden your perspectives to get this picture that I'm trying to paint for 444. Right? So, again, they had somebody had their hand up his back. He started promoting champagne. Or, or if he told you to change clothes, you put on a fucking button up. I knew Jay-Z had great influence when the towers fell on 9-11. Elaborate, please. I will elaborate. The towers come down. Boom. The world is in chaos because we are the empire state. We sit on a grid line that reverberates all around the world. Right? Right. Jay-Z's album Blueprint dropped the same day. That week he moved... About 800,000 units. <laughs> right? Yeah. Just process that for a minute. That was my first moment to go, oh shit. This dude, because listen, you should be getting water. You should be preparing an exit plan. You should be, you know, loading up your guns. You should be preparing. No, 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 no. Niggas went and got the Jay-Z album. Put an L, popped up an L, and listen to the blueprint. While the world around them was technically collapsing. That, my friend, is power. Right? You don't think them Jews saw that same shit? You know what I mean? Yeah. That, wait a minute, wait a minute. Niggas are standing in line because you had to physically buy it. Right. It wasn't an online download. You had to physically get in line at fucking... Wherever they sold DD, CDs or DVDs at that time, wait in line and pick up this nigga's album. Right? right? That's crazy. That either says our priorities are fucked up. <laughs> or it says our people knew something that most people didn't. That this is all bullshit. It's all an illusion. Even if it was in our subconscious mind, that we recognized it was an illusion at the end of the day, 800,000 units, number one album in the country. 
right? right? That's when I said, okay, okay, I, I see what's going on here. If I recognize it, these Jews, uh, they're astrologists, numerologists, occultists. They do geometria. They may know who Jay-Z is from five lifetimes ago. He might be Musa Mansa. You know what I'm saying? After they did all of their shit, his cosmic fingerprint, they may have been trailing this motherfucker through dimensions. I don't know. Right? right. And all of a sudden, the signal got strong in Marcy Projects. Who the fuck really knows? You know what I mean? But I know that we may not know who we are, but they, right? And they go, this is a special goyim, because you ain't nothing but a goyim to Jewish people. They can, in their laws, in their books, they can use you and do what the fuck they want to do with anybody who's not Jewish. Rape, pillage, murder, blood sacrifice, lie on, steal from you. But the goyim is the one that they specially craft to help them remain unseen while the goyim does the work. So Jay-Z became famous for talking material shit. Right? Uh, you know, how, how to get stylish clothes and this, that, and selling drugs and this and that, and calling himself Jehovah. And you know, as the Jews, how they see that, oh, that was clever how he used that. You know what I mean? And began to work their magic in conjunction with his magic. All right? right. So now we'll get into a little bit of the conspiracy aspect of this, but I want to, you know, paint this picture because I don't want to make it seem like it's just cut and dry that uh, this dude just showed up and he's doing things. Of course, he's getting help. You don't think LeBron James is getting help? Right. Right. They all you don't think Jordan was getting help. They're all getting help to some capacity. You can't operate within their realms without them. But. What Jay-Z is also sitting back because he's fighting the battle now. He's seen what happened to Michael Jackson. He's seen what happened to Prince. He's seen what happened to Whitney. He's seen what happened to Bill Cosby. He's seen what's happening, you know what I mean? To OJ as he broke down, right? He's right. seen what's going on and he's facing not only scrutiny from his peoples, the streets, right. he's also have to watch out for, for those who may be trying to ri ritualize his ass. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He's seen what happened to Tupac and Biggie. That shit between him and Nas could have got bloody. Them ether wars, because the proximity. Nigga, I'm from Brooklyn, you from Queens. Right. It ain't like West Coast versus East Coast, and you on a whole different coast. Fuck the West Coast, and you never have to go over there. No, nigga, we, we know the same people. Right. This shit can get bloody. So the fact that they didn't get bloody I began to think that they began to see, let's go about this a little bit different. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it could have got out of control. Any questions? Um, actually, no. Okay, okay. So now, uh, you know, we begin to see Jay-Z recognizes that there are, you know what I mean? People around him who could be coming at him from all directions. You know what I mean? That he has to fight up against him and his wife and him and his babies are coming at him. They're street level dudes. You know, he's got some unfinished business and we talk about how he get rid of these people and get, you can't operate within that construct. As we talk, Dame Dash came in trying to take all that shit over. Yeah. And shout out to Dame Dash because that's the, the road that he chose to take and still stands clear on his boss shit. Jay-Z was trying to say, as, as, as Will Smith said in the Ali movie, I got to put crooked Muslims together with Jews to get this shit done. Slinging bean piles on the west side of Chicago ain't gonna get this shit done. Right? right. But Jay-Z's agenda furthers somebody else's cause. Keep young people focused on material things and getting money. And like I said, he told you to change clothes, you change clothes. He said he was on to the next. Right? And then he used all that Baphomet Illuminati shit in his videos to thumb. That's all he was doing. Was taking advantage and thumbing up because he listens to the internet up at you people. You, I mean, come on. Every move Jay-Z makes is a calculated one. You think he would put, do as thou wilt, which is Aleister Crawley saying on his t-shirt without knowing it's going to create a buzz. He was taking full advantage of this new venture called the internet and internet trolls and keeping his name in the algorithms to make money. 
And the halo in the back. Yeah, the halo in the back, the skull, the bones, all the shit that we have been talking about, he neutralized it by making it a common term. He made the term Illuminati a, a usable word that could be used in everyday language now. And I felt he almost was trying to neutralize what it is me and the brothers I mentioned. Our team was trying to bring forth real information in regarding the Illuminati to get people to study, right? right? So he got wind of that somehow or through some connections because people, the internet opened up Pandora's box to a point where, uh, you know, you didn't have to study anymore. You could just ridicule a, a bunch of, see, I'm from an era when you went to lectures for eight hours and you had to steal yourself for seven, eight hours, right? Bobby Hammond would do hard copy and the shit would be two, three hours, just the hard copy. And you go, oh man, uh, let's start the lecture. What? Nigga, I've been here for three hours. You know what I mean? Phil Valentine would have these little yellow notepads to break down his, yeah. you know, his opening soliloquy could be an hour and a half or two hours of just fucking notes. And then he would go into the lecture and you'd be sitting there like. <laughs> but it, it forced us to still ourselves for four, five, six, seven, eight hours. There was no internet. You could only buy these VHS tapes, go home and study them for a piece. And we are back in the mix, right? right? So to sum up part one of this, we wanna talk about Jay-Z begins to understand business. He begins to understand what he tells you to buy. There are those who are benefiting off what he tells you to buy. I wrote an article 10 years ago called, uh, I think Ad Space or Rhyme Space. It's one of the chapters in the original book on how I give out these scenarios of JV saying, you know, companies saying, look, Jay, we want to get in business with you. Uh, you know, we know you rhyme about certain things and what you rhyme about people buy. And Jay-Z said, all right, well, listen, if it's the beginning of the rhyme, the price is this. If it's during the punchline or the end of the rhyme, the price is totally different. And I know that sounds crazy, but understand Pastor Cavassier and all of these songs began to serve as goddamn commercials. Rolling down the street, punching, smoking, and uh, sipping on Jan and Juice. Seagrams. Seagrams owned the record label in which uh, uh, Snoop was popping that off on, and they made tons of cash. So they began to see the magic of our words. And people began to follow these words. So why wouldn't Jay-Z being a smart man that he is, not just him, other ones saying, listen, my rhyme is for sale, but th there are certain components that's going to cost you more. If I mention your shit at the beginning of the rhyme, that ain't the climax. When I get to the end of the rhyme and throw a punchline in it, that's going to cost you a little bit more. And people thought I was bugging. And here we are in this stage now where everything is for sale. So, go ahead. He even um, he ushered that in with uh, product placement in his music videos. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll show them what you got was the one video that in particular where you see Budweiser yeah. and, and I told people 10 years ago that they, they're they gonna stop selling music because the internet has made it where music can be stolen and people can download and this and that. So the music is the movement, but it's gonna be sponsored by endorsements and so forth and so on. And Jay-Z is proving me right because he did the deal with Samsung for the uh, Holy Grail album, right. and now he's doing the deal with Sprint, which classified his album platinum Five without years. selling no goddamn units. Right. That's the world we live in now. And Jay, you the one who I believe said, women, men lie, women lie, but numbers don't. Well, this is a play on those numbers. If you go on platinum and ain't nobody buying no goddamn units, or you're getting Sprint to buy the units in advance, and they're shelling them out to the people and the people have not certified your album platinum by its great standard. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I listened to the album. I even hit Guru up to tell Jay-Z, thank you for the album because I think the world needs it. And we'll get into that aspect a little bit later. But, um, you know, just understand that he began to understand that when he stamped something that it wasn't just stamped for him. So just imagine, isn't that like almost insider trading? Imagine you know Jay-Z gonna rhyme about this, 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 this in advance. 
and you put your money on that in advance, isn't that almost like insider trading? Yeah, yeah. And I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just simply show, showing the power of his words and the power he has to change things as you know you see them. He even hit us with the uh, DOA shit, death of auto tune, and buried T Pain. Right. He murked T Pain with that. You know what I mean? Future, as Blue Pill said, came back, and now there's a whole nother movement going on. And you know, but just to show you, if Jay Z speak on something, he has the power to influence it in you know many different ways. So uh, now we'll get into when we get into part two, we'll be getting into the business aspect, the ability to move in a room full of vultures as Jay-Z speaks about, and how even though you're using me, I have to be able to use you to get what I want as well. Right. Because it's a chess game being played, and I'll speak about in my book, Hip Hop Decoded, the game of hip hop is like the game of chess, where I break down there are three levels to this game. There are multiple, but I focus on the first three levels, and I talk about how on level one of the game, Jay-Z's a king. Right, because he's a billionaire, he's a mogul. The queen would probably be the record label or the corporation. Rappers are nothing but pawns on the board who could be interchanged. And when Jay-Z moves on this level of the board, the whole board shifts. But on the next level of the game with corporations and the ones who have given this nigga the money, you know what I'm saying, Jay-Z is like a rook or a bishop in that aspect and doesn't have as much power, but still yields some type of power, but yet in the third level of this game, which are all being played multi-dimensionally, he ain't nothing but a, a goddamn pawn right. in the game. And his billion dollars doesn't even shape the foundation of things. I wrote that 15 years ago in Hip Hop Decoded to show you to expand your consciousness when you think about things and the people around the board watching the game are the ones being affected by the game. So they'll move a piece on the board, some niggas in the crowd vanish. You know what I'm saying? And this and that and you ooh and an I and the game is watching you while you're watching the game because ultimately you are the game. So Jay-Z's money on uh, one level is huge, a billion dollars, can't knock that. He can put a billion on the board. On the next level, shit, if Warren Buffett woke up with a billion dollars, he'd jump out the window, right. as Chris Rock said, you know what I'm saying, in his right. stand-up. And then a whole other level of the game, when you're talking about the Federal Reserve and the Rothschilds, who Jay Electronica was lined up with, their money can't even be counted. You know what I mean? Imagine them filling out an IRS report. So there are certain levels to this, and knowing and understanding when you think you're powerful, Realize that you ain't powerful at all. So with that, we'll end it there. UrbanX.NYC. This is part one, the making of 444. Bear with me. We, we will get to the actual album, which is like a fucking layup. That's the easy part of this breakdown to break down. But I want to paint a picture for you. So next we will deal with business. The shady side of business. The esoteric side of business and just business in general, and you can begin to understand what Jay-Z is up against is greater than what me and you may think. Right. So that being said, Urban X TV. Exclusive. Exclusive, we're gonna have something real, real special soon. Real special soon coming for you, so stay tuned. All right, we're gonna do it up real big. Peace. Peace.